when we're teaching you, we all know we have the term jhana. So if you write down jhana, you have the jhanas. And then what happens is you have, there are four jhanas, and then there are four mental jhanas under the fourth jhana. But also that today we call this eight jhanas, just to confuse you. <laughs> so, so, um, the rupa jhanas are the ones that are the ones where you can feel your body completely. And then the mental jhanas, your body basically is gone. It's not part of the story anymore. And you're not in the mental jhanas if you are still worried about your, you're worrying about your mental, uh, the mental level that you're going into or something, but you're concerned about your body, if you say you're concerned about your body, our question is there is no body. So if you're experiencing this set of things, there shouldn't be any body at all, or, or it should be disappearing. The body starts to disappear in the third, between the third and the fourth jhana. So if uh, we were trying to explain this to you, you know, and, and the jhanas are like, the, I think the easiest way for us to explain the jhanas to you is they're like signposts, okay? Just consider you're on a trip and you're on your way to a destination and there are signs along the way. And these, as I said, the first four signs, one, two, three, and four, those you can feel your body. So we call these rupas, the rupa jhanas, the arupa or the, no, the where the body's beginning to disappear, we call infinites uh, five, six, seven, and eight are consisting of infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and then what I call the big bragger, the one at the end is <laughs> neither perception nor non-perception. And at probably 85 or 90% of the people that talk to me about neither perception or non-perception are not in neither perception or non-perception. And the reason is because the way that they're presenting it to us, we understand they're not in it, is because you can't know that you're in it until you're not in it anymore. If that makes sense, which it doesn't usually, but what happens is you come out of your sitting and you sit there and question yourself. Was I asleep? Was I awake? Did I meditate or did I sleep? What happened just now? Because it's different. It's different. So this is something people don't, um, they don't identify with very well that one. Okay. Now, so jhanas are like signs along the way. Let's see if I can complete this little simile here. When we're dealing in the mental jhanas, well, let's start this way. When we're dealing in one, two, three, and four, we have a set of markers and that we can we hear about all the time in the text. We hear about these markers. And the markers are hallmarks, if you want to call them. I call them hall hallmarks. That, that indicate that somebody is there is by what's going on, what you're still able to do when you're in the first jhana and what is happening when you're in the second and what is happening in the third. And the way you learn about it in the texts, you will learn about it as these pieces that are occurring at first in that jhana, they will, some of them will disappear and new ones will form in the next jhana. And then in the next jhana, other things will fall away and certain things will happen in the next jhana. So this is this is how um, we we have these hallmarks in the first four jhanas. In the, in the first jhana, one of the things that's still going on is you still have thinking and examining thoughts. You still have thoughts come up and you can think with them and think about them. You have uh, one of the hallmarks that you've gotten there is the joy comes up naturally, and you have to describe that to us. And there is a kind of uh, mm, high level energy that's in this joy, but at the same time, it's surprising because it's a different kind of joy from anything you've discovered before in your life. You don't feel the joy that we're talking about in 
meditation is not the same as you experience outside. Okay. When the joy fades away, and it will, that's when tranquility arises. And when tranquility fades away, that's when happiness arises. So these pieces go like PT, and then when it fades away, you have Pasa D, that's your tranquility. When that fades away, you experience Sukha. And Sukha is different than the excitement that was in the first part of this joy, because this Sukha is an internal kind of contentment. That is what Buddhist happiness is. And the um, the joy that you're experiencing uh, in the first jhana, when I said it was different, if you want to make a note about this, there's five kinds of joy. Um, you have five types of joy. The first type of joy, the first three types, everybody can feel. Okay, so the lay person who's not meditating and the meditators can feel this one. Everybody can. First one is like you have goosebumps, goosebumps that happen. Something happens and you start smiling and this joy comes up and you're just happy, you know, and that lasts for just a few minutes. Okay, the second kind of joy is like um, a flash of joy. And this is a flash of joy that happens is like, it's not quite like as grand as lightning, but it's a flash that happens. You open the door and somebody just returned from the, from the from the military and they're there in the doorway you go wow they're there and it just goes through you and you feel it all through you but it's only a short burst a short time but it's longer than the first one it's maybe 10 minutes long and the third kind of joy is you are standing in the ocean and the water is up to your waist and the waves are coming and they're just washing over you and washing over you. And this is really, really nice. And this can happen, can keep going for 20 minutes, can even happen for, you know, even longer than that. It's just this perfect coolness coming over you. It's just wonderful. Okay. And these three kinds of things anybody can experience. But then when you start to do meditation, you open the doorway to two other kinds of joy. The first kind of joy is a, a joy that comes inside and it's uplifting and you feel it a lot in your head. You feel lighter and very happy. You've never felt like this before. And it's kind of a surprise to most of us. It's been a surprise the first time this comes. And this is PT. Okay, and this comes up and it has a lightness to it and has a kind of excitement and energy in it and it rises up and it's there and then it can be there for a little while while you're in first jhana and then you move on and you go into another jhana. It gets a little stronger, a little more body to it than that. And then that one starts feeling less and less, getting less that happens as it as it's in the second jhana okay now the last kind of joy is called all pervading joy and these last two kinds this one i just described the pt and then this mudita this mudita joy and the enlightenment factor of joy is a much a more internal thing it's inside you and it goes all through you and this is the one if you get this going you taste it you know you can bring it up sometimes you can bring this up and just walk around in either one of these the pt or this one and you're in it with a lot of equanimity it's really really nice okay and it keeps going for a while so these are the five kinds of joy that you can experience that are happening now what we're talking about is the the jhanas one two three and four between three and four you have what's happening is losing feeling beginning to lose touch with the body and in the fourth jhana you have this balanced mind this equanimity we call equanimity but it's very strong four-footed equanimity is there four-footed very solid and you need that balance 
of equanimity in order to go through the mental part, the mental jhanas. You need this to be established in order for you to, um, to ha have this experience where you can watch the mental states. That's what's important, okay? And you go through infinite space, infinite consciousness, and nothingness. These, these are we have we have lots of observation that we can do in infinite space, and this is internal in your mind. Now, when we're talking about the depth of this, with when you're in these states, here here is the thing that here's the thing that's happening to confuse people. We have the jhanas and the names of the jhanas: one, two, three, four, and then infinite space, infinite. Co consciousness, nothingness, neither perception or non-perception. But when we're talking to you in your interviews, we're talking about how long you are sitting. And when you get to an hour, an hour and a half or two hours of sitting, we start using more terms, more terms. Like we'll say, um, we'll say uh, mm, quiet mind, quiet mind. And quiet mind is an, is an example of when you're sitting for a long time in a mental jhana, seeing quiet mind, nothing is moving around. So we're reminding, our, reminding ourselves, nothing is, nothing is moving around here. We can just watch this realm, watch what's going on. So we're talking about the realms. And these are like, uh, we might say, sit with quiet mind and, and say that it's not a different level. It's a condition we want you to sit in at whatever level you're in, you see? And you're in infinite space, infinite consciousness or nothingness, and you're sitting with quiet mind. We might say to you, quiet mind with a little more energy or quiet mind with, or bright mind. We might ask you to sit in bright mind. In other words, your mind is not bright enough to all of this, all that we're talking to you about when we're interviewing you is, we are trying to uh, encourage the operation of the meditation. The whole time we're teaching you, we're trying to teach you about how to make the meditation operate smoothly and clearly so that you can explain back to us in the same language we're talking, you know, what is going on and exactly how you are doing, okay? And we want you to be able to be able to uh, we want you to be able to watch as succinctly as possible, as, as, as precisely as possible, what's going on and be able to, to describe this to the person who's interviewing you. Now, I know this must be really tough if you're using um, a computer form and you're just writing to the teacher and they're just writing back and that's it, okay? But when, when I was doing online retreats, originally when I started the online retreats, I was writing to a person. They were um, writing to me a report. I was writing back to them. And then if I had a question about what they said, I would say, please do and add one, uh, you know, a first, uh, your first, first note at for day one ad note, I would call it an ad note. So you got to write to me again to clarify. So we were communicating um, as closely as we could without stopping to see each other. We didn't see each other on Zoom back then. This is 2005. And we had to communicate what we were feeling, what was going on by writing to each other. Rarely, I would call someone on a phone and say, look, I don't understand what you mean when you say, for instance, uh, meditation, or when you say mindfulness, I need to know when people come to us to practice TWIM, uh, they often, they come to us uh, with their idea of what the meditation is about and what it should do. And they come to us with an already preconceived idea of what mindfulness means. And for us, mindfulness is very clear. It's not complicated. Mindfulness is your observation skill. And it's special because this observation skill that we teach you is going to help you to be able to say to us what's going on more precisely, you see? So 
when we have the jhanas then and we have the toning these tone words like quiet mind and then we might say bright mind and we might say still mind and all of this what we're saying to you where do we get these ideas to say to you in interviews what you say to us tells us exactly what to say back to you <laughs> frustrating isn't it yeah but that's what is actually going on and trying to explain to a teacher what you say to us tells us exactly what you need and we need we say back to you and sometimes you even tell us even more precisely than precisely you'll say I think I might need a little bit more energy and we'll say well first off you need more energy there you go <laughs> the words of the of the prophet has spoken but you just told me that you know or you say I'm just so tired I don't know what to do I can't meditate well you need to get up and walk you need to walk and get your energy flowing and get your circulation going you can't just sit and then say and finish this one and then take a yawn and stretch your feet and say okay let's do another one you should be walking 15 minutes per hour uh, on the ratio of 15 minutes for each hour and no more than 45 minutes, which you're taking a walk at that point. But, you know, no more than 45 minutes. We say that we don't tell you anything, by the way. I don't tell you anything that I haven't watched Bonte and I to test with 40, 50 or 100 people first to see what happens if we say this to you or we or you're doing this or you're doing that you see we don't just say something to you everything that we were doing or saying in uh your interviews were very calculated things we, okay but you have jhanas um, you have the names of them you have these statements about the deeper mind which is quiet mind and now you're 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 using quiet mind but i need you to make it brighter i need you to to um have more stillness in in what you in what you're watching from what you've said to me you're you're looking at different places you don't need to be looking so what should I be looking at, Sister Kama? <laughs> you, you should be looking at a screen inside to start with. To start with is a good place to understand that you can watch things inside. You tell the person to watch, pretend you're going to a movie. And I give you a ticket, it's free. And you say, well, what's playing, Sarah? And Sarah says, I have no idea. Just please go and sit there and watch the screen in front of you and see what happens next just see what happens in a dark screen in front of you you close your eyes and you start watching that way and pretty quickly i think people realize that they do have a peripheral vision they have a side vision when they're watching inside just the way i have a side vision i'm not this is tunnel vision when i come to you like this <laughs> okay this is tunnel vision <laughs> okay and I have no side view but side view you need side view too you know and you have that inside just the way you have it outside it gives you a broader base of view okay then we might talk to you about the color and the tone of the or the texture of what it is that's happening in the jhana you might speak to us that way or we might speak back to you in terms of that you know and the, uh, the um we're interested in colors if colors come up like what color came up like if it was pink that's great you know pink is like full of energy and you want to move forward and pink pink light or pink brightness is a very good thing red is too much energy okay too much energy green is like you're going to go to sleep soon okay okay um blue is a very good one it's a it's a higher level one and um you're violet or your purple is not usually seen but in the deeper levels there might be some kind of a background that's that's a, a purple or a blue and sometimes when you're in quiet mind very very deep uh, when there's somebody who's sitting for uh, like three four hours they'll say I'm, they come to you it's very interesting they come to you and they say 
I need to do my interview now. Um, and they talk to you this loud and no louder at all. And they're so still and so quiet. You have to lean over to see what they're saying sometimes because they haven't moved in four hours. And they'll finish and they'll come over and they'll do their interview. And my favorite story about that sort of thing is a guy came from the East Coast, from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, out to Missouri. And um, I had never, I had experienced this but I had never seen anybody else experience it in front of me before. And I, my experience of it was quite different from this. But what happened to him, he fell into a state of equanimity, just total, complete equanimity. He reached into a level where there was just no discontent at all. And so he was well into uh, the... Uh, nothingness okay and then he was actually playing with neither perception or non-perception because of what he was answering and i had never seen anyone answer this way Bonte said to him so how's it going fine <laughs> you know <laughs> he didn't say anything and and i was behind behind him writing notes and I watched it from behind and then Bunty said well what's it is anything happening that's new it's fine <laughs> he wouldn't say anything except it's fine because it was fine <laughs> That's what. And afterwards, I said, Bonte, what was that? You know, because he said, well, you're doing fine. Go back and sit. And then I said to him when the guy left the room, what is that? He said, that is equanimity. He's, there's nothing in here anymore. There's no thoughts at all going on. There's no observation besides the observation of what's right here that's happening and if it's nothing you know it's fine <laughs> and so he was trying to get across there's just nothing no aversion to anything and there wasn't anything happening and so this is the kind of experience that you can have when you get into deep deep uh, equanimity <laughs> <laughs>